it's impossible to begin this session without saying something about um, the thing that just happened this morning. Um, and that's not only because, as good luck would have it, the text we are reading today, who caused uh, introduction to Anti-Oedipus, the, the preface to Anti-Oedipus, is also subtitled, uh, or is also known as introduction to a non-fascist life. Um, so, um, I just want to say, I mean, I don't know what is your politics. So I don't want to, um, to make any presumptions about it. But I want to say that um, while it is okay to feel depressed, it is not okay to give up. And I think that is true where whatever place you are coming from. And not giving up means giving up making up, giving up having fun, giving up being playful, you know. As we will see in this text, Foucault is saying, just because what you are fighting is abominable, it doesn't mean that you need to be sad. He says there, don't be a sad militant. And I think that, that's something that I really want to think about today, about how it is possible to resist and how it is possible to fight and to uh, work towards change without becoming sad. Because once you are sad, the others already born, you know? Um, and even if you don't know, that is okay. These things will get clearer. So, um, and I think also, you know, it was, there was never maybe, for a long time, um, art kind of performed a quite strange function. On the one hand, being a sort of investment vehicle for the super rich, and on the other, a kind of form of popular entertainment for the masses. But it is also possible that right now, um, art is also something else. Uh, art is also a way of speaking the truth, of some form of truth, not necessarily truth of right or wrong, but maybe truth of one's feelings, maybe truth of one's making. So I think, I think what you are doing now is kind of it seems to me it's very, very important that you continue doing, you know? And, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all really I wanted to say. And, um, and I think, you know, if I didn't have this seminar today, if I didn't know that I would come out of the house and I would meet you, I would not get out of there. <laughs> but, uh, but there is an energy here and there is a spirit here. And do you know, did, have you noticed that we always sit around the table like this? Why do you think that is? Why do you think we sit around the table? Why do we not have um, desks like in school? You know, so we will have sort of lines and, and the teacher. You know, what do you think this way of installing the seminar, and again, I'm using this word installing, because this is also specific installation. What do you think is, what are we getting at? <laughs> by installing the seminar in this way. Well, it's like a sharing of ideas rather than a dictatorship of ideas. Yeah. Yeah, it attempts in a small way to somehow undermine a kind of hierarchy. It puts everyone on the same level. Um, it's also quite interesting that um, the, the way we sit like this, it allows us to look at different people. You don't just stare at the back of someone in front of you or someone next to you. Um, it allows you to create different moments of eye contact and the conversation can go in various directions. It doesn't have to just come, let's say, from here to different <coughs> people. It also can go through um, and across and kind of diagonally. Uh, and that is a seminar. Remember that because uh, if you are in a teaching situation, in a situation where you need to give a paper or give a talk, if you can get the room to this kind of formation, you're going to have a much better time. Um, and 
The other thing I want to say is that the board seminar, do you know what it means? What is the origin of the board seminar? Central seats or seats? That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, it's like the board semen, yeah, which is seeds. So a seminar is sowing of the seeds. Now when you sow seeds in a field, some seeds will fall on fertile ground and they will uh, take root and they will grow. Others might fall on the rock or might fall on the road and nothing will happen to them, but that's okay. Yeah? Um, Sowing is not about making sure that every seed is in the right place. Yeah? And so not everything you say will take root. But the seminar is an environment where some things, some thoughts, some experiences might take root and then develop. <coughs> or they might not. And all of that is okay. Um, okay, so um, Let's see, what have we done last week? Where we attempted the impossible, we wanted to cover, I wanted to discuss uh, Heidegger's essay, the question concerning technology um, in this one session. And I think we did rush it a little bit towards the end. So I want to just briefly go over what Heidegger is saying about technology and use it as a way to move into 20 years old um, and slightly like different cultural environment <coughs> to the moment when Foucault writes the introduction to Deleuze and Guattari, uh, first volume of their shared book, uh, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And this volume is titled Anti Oedipus. So there's a lot already here which we need to explore. But going back to Heidegger's question of technology. So Heidegger is saying something quite simple. Uh, well, you can grasp it. You can grasp it simply if you like. So let's do that first. He says, Stop, "Don't think about technology in the usual way. Develop, as he says, an extraordinary way of thinking about technology." So there are two things. First is, what does it mean to think in a way which is extraordinary? <coughs> in a way which is outside the norm. Heidegger says, this is the only way to think. If you just repeat something that you have, if you just repeat common sense or common knowledge, that's what you mentioned, yeah? You're not thinking. To think is to <coughs> go into the wilderness, is to think the impossible, is to think the extraordinary, the unusual, the paradoxical. All these things mean the same thing. Uh, if you work, if you begin from perceived ideas or perceived notions, you are not thinking. You at best regenerating some thoughts, but you never get to examine what they are based on. And then the question of technology. He says the technology is too important <coughs> to be left for the technicians or technologists uh, or the people who uh, or the shop attendants in the in, in PC world or something like that. Technology is too important to be left on its own. Technology is not just something we use, it's not just something we um, turn to in order to achieve our goals, it's much more than that. Technology <coughs> is the determining factor of our age. And so he says we need to reevaluate the role of technology in our lives. And we need to, to do it by learning to think about it in a different way, not in the usual way. So the usual way of thinking about technology is as a tool, as a means to an end, as something we do that makes us human. And Heidegger says all of this, while it's correct, it's not helping. We need to understand that our relationship with the world is technological. So how are we in the world today? He says, well, we are in the world technological. Just as, let's say, you might say that in the Middle Ages, we were in the world religiously. 
our experience of the world was um, theological or religious. The, the modern experience of the world is technological. And that means that technology is not just a tool. It is something that reveals to us the essential nature of our age. So how do you get this expression? Technology is nothing technological. Just try to play it a little bit in relation to your own practice. You know, photography doesn't need to be photographic. Yet, art doesn't need to be artistic. Um, and see how that already opens up a bit of space to do something slightly different. So what is technology for writing? Technology is both making and Poetry. It's both Making poetry. It's both the techno and the poesis. poesis. <coughs> by that he means, and I want to put it in, in, in very simple terms, by that he means that when you do something with technology, like, you know, putting a socket in the wall, or fixing a wheel on your bicycle, or uh, you know, building a house, digging, digging, a, digging a web, or uh, coding, some, or working in Photoshop. You're not only operating on something out there, you are also being changed and modified in the process. Yeah. Technology is also changing you at the same time as you change, as you work with it. So, what you could do just to, to start getting Heidegger's way of thinking about technology. Just think that, you know, the, the technical is also the expressive. In traditional photography studies, uh, and maybe um, Anastasia, maybe you could, uh, because you, you just said you are a practicing photographer. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe I'm wrong here, but, but, uh, but I, want to, I want, would like to know what you think about it. In traditional photography practice, the technique is usually removed from the final result, the image. In the picture, we don't... So the, the, the finished image normally doesn't carry any marks of its production within it. We remove, let's say, we make sure that we don't see, let's say, the cables running on the floor. We make sure that the leg of the tripod is not in the frame. We make sure that the presence of the photographer is not pre present. So we leave the image, but we remove all the production scaffold. Everything that happens around it has to remain outside. So the image is kind of untouched by the technology that made it. Is it does it make sense? Yeah? And Heidegger wants us to rethink that. He wants us to realize that you might think that in the studio you make something creative or poetic or you want to put some thoughts across in your image. And Heidegger says the poetic is not the composition you have on your light table or the whatever you arrange there under your lamps and under the camera. The poetic is the technology itself. Yeah? Now, figure a way of exposing or exploring the poetics of your own production. Why do you think Heidegger says that production itself is poetic? And before you answer this question, it's perhaps useful to, uh, to remember that um, our traditional thinking is completely not like that. We keep things very separate. We know that there is the base and there is superstructure. So if you, for instance, study Marxism, um, then in Marxism there is a very strong notion that there is the base, which is the uh, economic um, moves, um, industrial moves, um, you need to earn a living, you need to put the bread on the table, all of that. Once that is done, that is done, then you might have the superstructure above the base where you have culture, yeah? So after a day's work, 
you go home, you switch or on your Wi-Fi and you listen to some Mozart. Yeah? But that comes after you build the base. Yeah? So there is this, this distinction which is very deeply ingrained in the way we think about what we do as artists, that the making and the meaning are completely separate. Yeah? The beautiful, the aesthetic, the seductive, the enjoyable is above and separate from the messy, the dirty, the, the hammering, the making, the shopping, the, you know? And Heidegger says not so. He says it's all connected. How is it connected? Because the process of uncovering something truthful is always a, a process of revealing and concealing. The, the, the truthfulness, whatever it is you are working in, whether it is an image or a composition or installation, uh, whatever it is, uh, or even if you're just making a chair or building a birdhouse, uh, the truthfulness is revealed in the process of making. That's why technology for Heidegger is both the way something is being made and the way the act of making reveals some deep truth about the maker and that which is being made. And this truth is a kind of poetry. Yeah. So Heidegger says, to put it in, in, in completely brutal, Terms. He says, do not separate your production from the final result. Or in other result, in other words, he says, don't follow, don't chase the result. It's the production <coughs> that matters. It's the production itself where the poetry of your enterprise lies. Yeah? Now, that might say, what, what, does, what can it mean in the context of making a photograph? What can, <coughs> what can it possibly mean in the context of making a photograph? How can you make the production itself visible? Maybe you repeat something about power structures? Oh. How? How? How will you do that? What, what, what will you have in the image? No? Your thumb. That's good. Yeah. You might you might have your thumb. You might, for instance, look at the photographs previously you discarded as accidents. Because you maybe you had your thumb, maybe you had the, the, the camera strap, maybe you had um, maybe the exposure and the focus are wrong. But you might say actually in these images something unexpected is being made present. My process of working, my production. Yes. But I think also he's talking about the essence. Who is talking about the essence? I that. Essence of what? Essence of the work of the process. And what, is the, essence? Essence. And what is the essence? Is what is lying behind of the process and behind of the image, behind yeah. the, 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 the production. And, and what is the essence? How to explain that? Um, it's the connector that um, connects everything. It is is the is the power that lies behind it. And what connects everything? Um, Presence. No, no. Heidegger doesn't talk about desire. You see, Deleuze does. Heidegger doesn't talk about desire. Heidegger knows nothing about desire. <laughs> uh, but you you kind of. I mean, yes, Heidegger does talk about essence. Yeah, but I did not say But I think you need to then be more precise and, and you need to understand what Heidegger means by essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not the usual, it's not... Um, Heidegger's understanding of essence is quite specific. So that's what you might want to, um, to explore. Look, do you want to say? Um, I was going to say, was it in, like, the intention of that, rather than design, the intention of the person making it? My question, I don't want to move away from it yet. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, uh, how do we make a picture that contains within it the, the process of its making? Like without thinking. 
Sorry? Without thinking. Without thinking, that might be one way. Uh, but we also might end up with something very uh, like a tourist photo, which are usually done without thinking. Thank you. But just as an example, you said about uh, it's very popular in Russia when uh, they make a selection of photographs, and everybody's like wedding photographs, and you have like a beautiful, you know, the, the pose, uh, like pose and corporate like, in the front, and then the photographer did the thing, and on the behind, you have like this funny, I don't know, like accidental. <coughs> Like figures of people, like I don't know, islands on the beach and some like a strange naked kids or what is like the photographer didn't think, didn't kind of like make it so and it's supposed to be perfect. Can you do you have an example of uh, one second Julia? Do you have an example of uh, think about an example of art practice uh, of whatever kind where the process is Part of the board, Julia. Um, I basically just, it's not a photograph of the I think I, I cannot remember if it's a painting by Vermeer, and it, it's, it's a portrait of a family. Yes. And uh, he, Velasquez. and then part of the painting, he, so Velasquez, that's it. Yeah, that's and Oh, that's little, Meninius. Yeah, and he includes, there's a little okay. part of the painting which yes. is dedicated to reflecting the canvas in which he's yes. painting. So that's good. Uh, but he, he, but he, 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 I think, is the, is the way to look at it. Um, so for instance, do you know the Beckers? Yeah. yeah. You all do, yeah? Okay, now, I think the Beckers are very Heideggerian in their approach to photography. There is definitely a research paper there. Um, because they present their images in the form of what we used to call a contact sheet. Yeah. And what is a contact sheet? It is a part of the process of making that normally is excluded from the way the work is being seen. Yeah? So they already, by, um, by offering the, their work to view like this, in this uh, nine up grid, they already reference the process of making, because you have this kind of property from which you select the images. But even more than that, because in their um, uh, topologies series, um, the images are kind of quite similar every time the same image is being repeated with some differences. Yeah? This very fact, this very act of repetition, or in other words, the very act of, the very fact that you don't look at a single image, but at a series of practically identical ones, reminds you of the photographic process, which is serial <coughs> and reproductive in its essence. Yeah? So here is photography that instead of hiding its tendency to reproduce, brings it into the work and makes it a key feature. So in, in the end, it's not even about these towers. It's about how these towers can be reproduced. So photography here is kind of facing itself. So when you look at the image, more than you see these towers, you start seeing photography itself at work. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? You see you see it? Yeah, you get it. As a representation. Sorry? As a representation. Not as a representation. But the towers know. are being represented. Photography is simply being present. Because there is no picture here of photography. It's just that the process itself is not removed. For instance, I will give you an example. Um, until about last year, most of the buildings around King's Cross here, they were all in the process of being built. They, they were all covered with scaffolding. But once the builders finished, the scaffolding was removed. And I was thinking, why are they removing the scaffolding? You know, it, it actually looked better with. Uh, and in any, I mean, why was so in a rush to remove the traces of making? to remove the traces of something that was produced. Why do we need to make sure that these buildings look immaculate, as if they just kind of landed like this from space, you know? Why to uh, hide the, or to erase all traces of the labor that made it? Yeah, because it's a choice. We could imagine, we could imagine it otherwise. We could imagine an approach to labor 
that instead of trying to erase all traces of it, actually celebrates it within the object. Would um, Wally Beshti's uh, folded paper ones, oh, so photograms, be another example of that? Could be. I mean, all I want to say is that artists use this way of thinking a lot in relation to various practices. You know, I think if you go to a um, contemporary gallery, um, you can often interrogate an artwork in terms of how it addresses its own production. <laughs> yes. Sorry, one second. I also thought about a very simple way to show the process in the final picture is a reflection of the camera of a photographer. Yes. And I think uh, Newton used to do that a lot. Yes, uh, Newton has Newton has used to do, do, to do it. Um, I guess that itself can become a kind of cliche yes, and you course. need to uh, i think what Becker's do is much more interesting because all newton could all newton was capable of helmut newton the famous fashion photographer he only could represent himself in the picture what Becker's do they don't represent the process they allow they just don't remove it they allow the process to become revealed because where is the process <coughs> you know it's nowhere as an image, and yet it is present. Uh, <coughs> so in, in painting, you've got the brush strength, I guess, that can and you don't even have a brush strength. It could be, uh, but I said for one second. I think that a brush stroke is one way in which, uh, by which the hand of the artist is present. But I think with, with painting, there is no, no clear par parallel here between painting and photography because in painting the idea that it was made by a genius who left their mark is quite accepted. In photography we don't have this idea. Um, it's so, uh, so it, kind of it seems to me that painting and photography have to seek very different strategies for dealing with their own Processes of production, Julia. Would Warhol be a good a good parallel to draw? Between yes, it would. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Warhol would be a great parallel, a, a great, uh, um, you know, pop, pop art, uh, but also the work of Duchamp. Uh, yes. I was just thinking about um, <coughs> Russian by erasing into cubing drawings. Of course. Like, like erasing yes. the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so now you realize that actually what Heidegger is talking about, while it is philosophical and very abstract. It's also, uh, he's kind of describing in a very direct way um, a key strategy that art is using. And the strategy is to do with the technology of its own production. Mm -hmm. One moment, one second. And just to keep it, because we're going to move to Foucault in a minute, but just to keep it um, um, somehow, so what I want you to, to think about is how in Heidegger we make a kind of attention shift from the image as the be all and end all of our creative process to the process itself. Heidegger says, and I will go to your questions in a minute, Heidegger says, truth, and whatever you mean by truth, it doesn't matter, you can call it, uh, in, but, or the essence, you know, uh, to use Irene's uh, comment earlier, is revealed not in the image, but in the process. Yeah? Now put that in your development tank and smoke it. <laughs> um, truth is revealed not in the image, but in the process. Why? That's the question. Because the image can only represent, but truth cannot be represented. We already know that everything that is represented, already part, part of the scientific discourse, is already mediated by subject-object relations, to get to truth, all we can do is uncover it. And it gets uncovered in the process of making. Now we had a couple of questions, you did. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. Uh, you said to shop, so I assume we thought of the yeah. three stoppages, which is also an exploitation yeah. of chance and randomness, yes. and then you just, Good. you know, laminate it in time. Mm -hmm. Laminate the idea of, of, of chance yes. and time. Well, that's why I said you, you can find um, the whole tradition of artists that generally are kind of um, probably belong more to the conceptual uh, side 